We're running away. Uh, we're actually going somewhere where we've been before. We are. We're a gonna, place we love. Yeah, we actually do. We love it. Um, we're going to go to Julian Price Campground up on the Blue Ridge Parkway. Yep. And um, um, we thought we'd just give you a quick overview about what we thought we would talk about on this particular uh, video. We have friends who have campers, and we have people we've met camping who express um, confusion and concern and, and discomfort about going off grid. I would say mostly concern. Yeah, like and how people, do you do it? What do you? What do you? What if this? What if yeah, that? I think people are a little intimidated. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to a campground that is has no hookups of any kind, and um, we were selective about our site. And we can talk about that later on when we get to the campsite and explain why we picked the site we picked. But anyway, in Blowing Rock, it is about 10 degrees cooler. Yeah, which is than at our house. That that's you know not accidental. Right. Yeah, yeah. That is a big part of the reason why we are going to the mountains. Right. But we are excited. We've been looking forward to this trip for a few months, and uh, we are in the truck, ready to drive out of the drive. We're going to kind of give you like a running. Uh, breakdown on a daily, semi-daily basis uh, about you know how the power is running, how the yeah. water is doing, how the sewer is doing, and all of those things, and how and we deal with all of those things. Yeah, how we conserve water and um, and those are the kinds of things that we will talk about and how we manage that. Hey, gangsters. Good morning. Yes, good morning, gangsters. We This is day one mm -hmm. of our trip to Julian Price Campground. We're going to be here for 10 days. Yes. And this video is going to be about boondocking or about off-grid camping. Our heart and goal here is to kind of help people who, first of all, people who have never boondocked yes. to not be so fearful about it mm -hmm. uh, and number two to kind of maybe educate on how to manage boondocking a little bit better not run into a situation where you don't have any power you don't have any water you don't have any utilities there's a few things that you need to do to be proactive if you're going to be boondocking anytime that you go camping anytime that you go out into the wilderness mm -hmm. you you have to be prepared regardless of where you're going and when you're going and and how you're going like you know if we were tent camping we would be prepared differently than we we're prepared with the tab um but either way you got to bring some stuff so you know we packed the stuff the tab that we bought came with a solar package 
we beefed it up. Mark did that. He can speak to that. I know we have two batteries instead of one. We have 200 amp hours worth of lithium uh, batteries, yes. Yeah. So, um, but I know we bought a camper that was boondock ready. It says boondock on the outside somewhere. Boondock edition. Right. You know, we've got 25 gallon water tank and we've got gray tank and a black tank and we have solar panel on the roof, but we brought an additional solar panel so that we could park our camper in a more shady location than baking in the sun all day and put the extra panel movable from place to place to put it in the sun. Uh, an important probably clarification for that is you do need to have a long enough cable to do and, that. A, and a big enough gauge cable to be able to do that. This one is 40 feet, I believe. And yeah. so it's plenty long enough to get it to a location where there is sun in most circumstances. And that, that's what right. we were talking about planning ahead and, and planning for boondocking, you right. know. Right, and but I it think does require a little forethought. Everyone will benefit from you going into detail mm -hmm. about that, where mm -hmm. you plug it in on the camper, what that connection looks like, what kind of a wire and why, mm -hmm. those details that I don't know anything about. You, you just handled it for me. Right. He's going to do that. <laughs> but part of the confusion which came to light this morning <laughs> when my Apple Watch wasn't charged was that um, I didn't have a clear understanding of which outlets inside of our tab 400 which is boondock ready has solar panels on the roof blah 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 will charge my devices my phone and my apple watch and my kindle just by plugging into them i now have had a thorough introduction to all of the outlets inside our tab and what ones are able to do which things and basically I would say if you have a boondock ready camper, you probably have the same three kind of outlets. One kind is a DC and it, it will always be, it'll always work. If you're on solar or if you're plugged into city power, the DC outlet will always be DC. And DC means uh, direct current, which means it's coming from the batteries. You're doing wonderfully. <laughs> Good. <laughs> the second kind of outlet that we have inside of our camper is an outlet that only works when the inverter is turned on. And the inverter turns the DC power from the batteries into AC, which is alternating current, which is what people might call shore power or city power. That's the electricity that you get at your house. And that's what you get when you're plugged in in your camper somewhere. When you're boondocking, you don't have it. So the only way to have those outlets work, which in this camper we have two of them, is to turn the inverter on. And that converts your DC power to AC power. Mm -hmm. And then in the camper, we also have a couple of other outlets. There's one in the bathroom. There's one by the kitchen sink that are AC exclusive exclusively and they are not connected to the inverter so they will never give you power if you are off grid. Three kinds of outlets and you need to learn in your camper which outlets are which kind. That's true. You Otherwise you'll think you hey there, plug you something <laughs> in and it won't work. That's exactly correct. Okay so I'm going to add a little bit more that again I don't really know the details but different number of amp hours of battery enable you to have different size inverters. The inverter remember is what converts DC power to AC power and might allow you to run a coffee maker or in our case we bought a little immersion blender that connects to a small food processor that we can put frozen berries and heavy cream into and make ice cream. But you have to look at the wattage of your inverter, which in our case, it's a thousand watts. 1500. 1500. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at the wattage that your device is gonna use. And in our case, this little immersion, immersion. blender mm -hmm. is 280 watts. Mm -hmm. So it can, we can run that off of our batteries when we have the inverter turned on. Mm -hmm. And we have those two outlets that we could plug into that will work. That's, that's, we have pretty much exhausted my knowledge of boondocking. 
<laughs> One thing that she mentioned that um, I'm going to probably clarify a little bit. She had mentioned that the amount of amp hours determines the size of the inverter, and that's not necessarily true. You can have a, a you know a larger inverter on 100 amp hours worth of battery. The only issue is, is it's not going to run very long uh, if you're pulling the full amount of power from that inverter. So, right. and even with, I'm, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say this because I think a lot of people get, or get confused about this. For example, um, they actually sell a Tab 400 that has what they call a lithium package or full lithium package that has 400 amp hours, so 400 amp hours worth of battery capability. That's a lot of battery capability, okay? And they tell you, you can run your air conditioner off of it. And that's true, you can run your air conditioner off of it. And it's, it's wired up so that when the inverter is on, it sends AC power pretty much the entire camper. The entire camper is energized with AC power by the batteries. How long can you do that for? I'm going to say in the in real world conditions, probably not more than four or five hours. <laughs> yeah. So, and then yeah. you will have depleted 400 amp hours worth of battery. Does is that practical? Probably not really. You know. Right. Um, so I I think it's kind of in my in my way of thinking, it's a little bit uh, deceptive to tell people that you can run your air conditioner off of 400 amp hours worth of battery in a 3,000 watt inverter. Yes, you can. Can you do it in a practical sense? No, you, you can't. If you're going to be out boondocking, don't plan on running your air conditioner. Is my that I would suggest to you that it is not wise to plan for that. Right. You're going to have to have so much more battery power to practically do that, and that's not even worth it. You know, you're going to be spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on batteries to run an air conditioner. Yeah. Just yeah. just plan accordingly. Yeah. Like for example, uh, this is a perfect example. Down where we we live, it's currently about 10 to 15 degrees warmer there than it is up here in the elevated mountains of North Carolina. We come up here on purpose yeah. because it's cooler up here yeah. and you can be up here and be comfortable in the middle of the day it is not hot it's in mid 70s at at the most and at, the at home it'll be in the 90s but you can manage the temperature in your camper by opening windows mm -hmm. closing windows having the vent on you can run your fan the ceiling yeah. fan in the vent you can run that that's wired so that it runs on the DC power from your batteries. And maybe it would be wise at this point to clarify some of the things that do run off of DC power when you're off grid, you know, and it'll run, you don't even have to have the inverter on. This, this, all these things will work without the inverter on. Your uh, ventilation fan, both your bathroom fan and your um, fan that's in your main cabin area will both run. Your water pump will run, uh, heating system, will run refrigerator will run off of dc power your your fridge most well i should back up a little bit not all of the tabs uh, have just a pure dc fridge some of them have a three-way fridge some of them have a two-way fridge so i can't across the board say that they'll all work but the newer ones have just just a dc fridge that's all they have so yeah and i think that's part of the confusion honestly is that They've been changing things over the years, and um, things are not the same as they were. Like, you know, five, six years ago, if you bought a, a camper, you would want a three-way fridge. Well, whereas today, a DC fridge is, is good, it's you know? It's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So... Because our batteries are charging when we're driving down the highway. And yes. keeping the fridge going. Mm -hmm. And most highways, if you haven't noticed, are pretty sunny. Well, all, almost all day long. Yeah, so it's charging off of your solar panel that's on your roof. Um, yes. And that's another thing that we should probably talk about is considering is, you know, where you would park when you get to your destination. Is it shady? Is it sunny? You know, those things have a big factor in whether or not you can charge those batteries back up. That's our introduction, and this video will be about the details, and I will show on a daily basis. I'm going to give 
maybe not daily, but at least every other day, uh, a running tab on where we're at with the tanks, with our power, um, solar, all of that. gangsters I thought I would go do a quick uh, tip video on how we conserve uh, water one of the things that we do to conserve water is when we're doing dishes we just use a small amount of water in one of the dirty dishes this is just my dirty coffee cup uh, we just use a small amount of water a little bit of soap in there and then we got our little trusty uh, scrubby wash rag thing it's kind of like a little sponge thing and then I use just a paper towel to wipe out um, like this we had some kefir in so I'm just going to wipe it out instead of putting all that down the drain I actually use the paper towel and get the vast majority of that stuff out same way with like if you got a dirty plate or anything like that you know that you got food debris on rather than trying to put that down the drain um, just scoop it out with a paper towel and then you can just toss the paper towel in the trash and that's going to save you from having to run quite as much water uh, while I'm doing this I'll talk also about some of the other things that we do to conserve um, one of the things that we do is we sometimes will actually use the black tank as a extra gray tank in other words um, it seems to us, on our uh, experiences anyway, that we spend a fair amount of time um, with our gray tank filling up much quicker than our black tank does. We only use our black tank for number one, uh, and we mostly use it at night time. During the day, if we're at a campground where we've got some uh, uh, flush toilets, We'll actually use those instead of our toilet here and in this case like for example right here we're right by the the bathrooms you know so it's actually really close and we do not do number two which I think also will conserve some water for you um, it's we just use number two at the uh, bathroom facilities at the campground that we're at that's that's how we do it um, that you know I certainly there's times when you just can't and that's that's what you have it for you know you have it so that you can use it so certainly use it if you got it but if you can conserve then conserve um, that's just some of the things that we do to conserve water and then the only other thing I was going to suggest when when doing the dishes is once you get everything all soaked up and you know wiped off good and you feel like you've got things clean instead of running water constantly to just uh, kind of run just a little tiny bit of water just enough to rinse off the object that you're working on and I do use hot water to, to rinse the, the dishes off with but just turn it on a little bit rinse them off turn it off and doing that believe it or not <laughs> that actually does save a lot of water usage you know you can you still get your dishes clean and yet you're not consuming enormous amounts of your water and water is a precious commodity when you're <laughs> boondocking as you know we're boondocking this weekend and one of the things that we do sometimes when we're boondocking is we cook with fire and today we are going to be cooking a pork tenderloin and we're cooking it over the charcoal so 
Dutch oven style. Dutch oven. So I have found in my other experiments cooking in the Dutch oven that it's helpful when cooking meats in particular to make sure there's moisture inside there. So we have been enjoying Athletics non-alcoholic brews of late. This particular one is a golden ale and I put that in the bottom of my pan. Yum, yum. And yeah, it's there pretty it is, good. Bubbling away. There it is, in the bottom of the pan. And then I'm going to cut this tenderloin out of this bag. And I'm going to touch it the least amount I possibly can because it's yucky to touch it. And try to make it fit inside of here, which it does pretty well. Now, the only other thing I'm doing is I got this Cuban style citrusy garlic sprinkle at Trader Joe's. And it says on the outside of the package that it's a good rub for roasts, for steaks, for chicken, for pork. So I'm going to put a bunch on here before we close up the pan and put it in the fire. And then we're just going to put the cover on it and we're planning to cook it about an hour and 15 minutes. We want to make sure it's done because we're just worried about that sort of thing. Pork. Yes, we are. Yep. So the lid goes on and then... I'm going to put some coals on that bad boy. We'll place it in the fire. I usually basically try and fill the, fill the whole thing. Pull the, fill the lid pretty much with coals. I don't really know what the proper thing is to do, but it seems like filling it with the lid full of coals works pretty good, so that's what we're gonna do. it. Spread these out a little bit. And I'm just going to set these right on top of here. Set the pan basically. Or the Dutch oven rather. Right on top of there. There we go. All right. All right. Here we go. Okay, been an hour. Let's see if she can do this without dropping ash in there. I know. <laughs> That's the real question.
right, gangsters, for this little part here, I'm going to use a drawing that Pam made. Keep in mind that, you know, every camper is going to be different, but the concepts are basically the same. So I'm going to explain to you how our system works and how we recharge our batteries. So firstly, we have Pam drew this nice, beautiful sun up here. And this beautiful sun is also a variable factor because sometimes, you know, you might have clouds in the way or, you know, there's times when you're not going to have access to the sun. But when you do, you can use this system. The sun generates electricity by hitting the solar panel. The solar panel sends DC power, which is direct current power from the solar panel over to the plug in on your trailer. In our case, it's inside of the Nautilus water control system bin. Um, yours may be anywhere. It's specifically intended to plug in an external solar panel. The way this trailer is set up, on which we have a 200 watt solar panel that is external that we plug in using a very long cable. Ours is 40 feet long uh, into the external port for solar. Then we also have a factory installed solar panel on the roof, which is a 310 watt solar panel. Both of these solar panels gather sun energy and run them into what is called an MPPT controller. And it will send the necessary power to charge up your batteries. For the most part, uh, on this little trip here, we've had the batteries have gotten down to, let's say 75% is about the lowest they've got. For most days, if you got decent sun with our setup, we can get it charged back up to 100%. So sun, solar panels, MPPT controller to the battery. And then from the battery, you can go two different directions. You can run straight DC. The straight DC is pretty much always on. You know, it's something that's tied directly to the battery. So if your batteries are hot, then these things will be hot. Um, those will run things like your lights and fans. They'll run your DC fridge. It'll run any of your DC plugs. And I'll put a picture of that and what I'm referring to when I'm talking about DC plugs. Then you can also run your water pump and your Aldi system will all run off of just your DC power, okay? Which is going to come straight from your battery. Another option in some campers, uh, in ours, we have an inverter. We have inverter in our camper that is tied to two AC outlets in our camper. The rest of the plugs are dead. That's pretty much all we have. We don't typically use the inverter a whole lot. <clears throat> Once you get to that point, then I'm going to backtrack to this MPPT controller and uh, something called a smart shunt. The smart shunt is attached to the battery and the MPPT controller is what controls your solar input. Those can both be monitored using a Bluetooth app um, from Victron Energy. If, if you have Victron products, it has a Bluetooth transmitter on the MPPT controller and a Bluetooth transmitter on the smart shunt. And I am able to monitor all of those using a cell phone app and it'll tell me you know, the state of charge, and I'll put some of this stuff up on the screen as well. It'll tell me how much power I'm generating from the solar panels currently, and it gives me really a good bit of information about what is currently going on with my power system, both the battery state and the solar uh, charging status. So those can be extremely helpful in determining, you know, how proactive you need to be as far as getting your batteries up to snuff. So anyway, Pam did a wonderful job of drawing this lovely uh, picture of our camper and the sun, the solar panels, and I thought this was kind of kind of cool. So I'm actually doing this sitting here in the camper. <laughs> so at any rate, hopefully that'll help somebody. Hopefully that's clear. If you have any questions, you know, don't hesitate to make a comment, and I will try my best to answer them.
Hello there, gangsters. I've got a little bit of data for you that I think might be helpful. Um, this is all related to our boondocking trip that we did uh, up to Julian Price Campground. And uh, I kept track on a daily basis of my morning um, battery status and my PM or evening battery status. Um, and I also kept track of my freshwater tank uh, capacity, my gray water capacity, and my black water capacity. As you can see, most of those days, uh, I think four of the days, we were able to get, able to get all the way up to 100% uh, charge on the battery just from the solar. So, um, you know, we were never really in any risk of running out of power. You know, I'm hoping that providing you with, with this data will kind of ease your mind about whether you need to be concerned. Uh, we do turn the inverter on a couple times to use our immersion blender and to charge a couple of items. But as a general rule, we don't really turn the inverter on and we just use all of the DC functionality of the trailer. The blue line that you see is the fresh tank capacity. And when we got there, it was full. And then you can kind of just see a gradual drop over time. We had 25 gallons when we got there. Don't know exactly how much we had when we left, but we had water still. The gray tank and black tank, uh, as represented by the gray and dark gray bars, <clears throat> I'm not sure that I would completely trust uh, that information. It, it seemed to me that there was uh, some level of discrepancy with how accurate those sensors are. I don't know if it's got to do with maybe the muck and stuff that's in the gray tank or black tank, but at any rate, it doesn't seem like I would rely 100% on the uh, tank monitor for the gray and black tank. That's just my personal uh, thought on it. If you'll notice on the 11th, it's at a low point, and then on the 12th, it jumps back up to a full capacity again. The reason for that is that's the day that we did a dump with the... Um, external honey wagon. But anyway, hopefully this data here will kind of ease your mind a little bit, I'm hoping. Hey gangsters. So, um, I realize this video is a little bit different than our normal content, but we thought maybe it might be encouraging to some people that might be considering boondocking. And if you haven't done it before, hopefully this will maybe set your mind at ease. So one of the first questions is, people might ask about you know boondocking is why boondock to begin with like what's the benefit of boondocking you know and the main one for us is it saves money um, most of the places that you go are going to be less expensive if not free um, where you'll be boondocking at um, you know forest land BLM land a lot of that is just going to be free won't cost you anything um, and availability of camp locations like a lot of the places that you try and reserve if it's just a regular campground uh, or even like a national park or anything like that state parks can be really difficult to get into and um, one of the advantages of boondocking is that typically people do not want to boondock so therefore those camping locations are just more available so that's a plus less crowded that's also another plus and just a more natural setting under most circumstances. Sometimes that's not true, but as a general rule, uh, the places that you would be boondocking will be a more natural setting. So I got a couple disclaimers. Um, I realize that boondocking with kids is a challenge. Uh, we, when we had kids and we're camping, we didn't do a lot of boondocking. We were looking for, you know, full hookups and whatnot. And, and uh, you know, it's a, it's a huge challenge trying to boondock with kids. So we realize that. And we're not really trying to encourage someone who has kids to, to boondock, you know, unless you want to. I think it's possible. I just think that, you know, it, it's just much more challenging. So, you know, keep that in mind uh, as we're talking about boondocking. And then the other disclaimer is we're not experts. We don't know everything, but we've been camping for uh, over 40 years doing, you know, tents, backpacking, pop-ups, 30 foot trailer. We had a teeny tiny six by eight square drop for a while. Um, and we have failed a lot. You know, don't be afraid to learn from your mistakes. Uh, we've learned a lot of things from just screwing up. 
So uh, you're going to make mistakes. We'll start off with the three rules for boondocking. Uh, rule number one is planning. Rule number two is planning. And rule number three is planning. <laughs> yeah, that's the gist. Um, so you just got to ask yourself some questions like, where are you going to be camping? How long are you going to be staying there? What are the available facilities? Like, do they have flush toilets? Do they have pit toilets? Do they have no toilets? Uh, do they have showers? Do they have no showers? Is there a dump station? Picnic table, fire ring, you know, do they have any facilities at all? You have to ask yourself those questions before you arrive. Uh, what are the weather conditions going to be? And be prepared for both uh, extremes of hot and or cold, wet, dry. Check those things before you go, you know. Distance from resupply, that is an, an important one as well. How far away are you from fuel, water, food, dump station, propane? Our configuration for this trip was a, our 2024 Tab 400. We had two Battleborn lithium 100 amp hour batteries for 200 amp hours worth of power. Uh, 1200 watt Ames power inverter, uh, which came standard with it. And then a 130 Victron MPPT controller, a 310 watt roof mounted solar panel, and a 200 watt Renogy external panel that I have actually wired to the existing controller. That's something that I've done that doesn't come factory standard, so something to keep in mind when I'm talking about that. 40 foot wire for the external panel. Uh, we got a 25 gallon fresh tank, which was full, uh, 18 gallon gray tank, uh, 16 gallon black tank, a five gallon external tank that we bring with us. It's a little blue uh, tank that holds five gallons of water, fresh water. Uh, and then we also bring another one gallon fresh water stainless steel container. So, you know, all together we had a fair amount of fresh water with us because we like our well water. I've got a 20 pound propane tank and then, you know, on the trailer. Plus I had a spare tank in the bed of the truck and an additional 20 pound tank that I use for the Camp Chef stove that we use. The general scenario at site E9, which is where we were at Julian Price Campground in North Carolina, direct sun was available from about 10 a.m.-ish to 6 p.m.-ish uh, via the external panel. The main panel only got sun, direct sun, from probably about 11 to 3. Um, there's no power, no water, no sewer there. They do have dump stations. They do have flush toilets. And fresh water is also relatively close by you can you can get to it we actually didn't have a need to to get any to, we actually didn't have to fill our tanks with uh, any more water believe it or not we actually had water when we when we finished um, hot showers are available nearby at that location in julian price probably going to make a comment here about just some clarifying the differences between the DC 12 volt power capability of your trailer and the shore power capability of your trailer. Um, each one's gonna be different. So this is, I'm specifically talking about our trailer in this particular case. So you need to kind of learn what your trailer has, but basically what you can run in our trailer uh, when you do not have shore power and you're just running off of your batteries, you can run your lights, ventilation fan, water pump, Aldi heating system on propane, Aldi hot water system on propane, uh, your inside stove will work on propane, your DC powered fridge in our case is a DC powered fridge. You might have a three-way fridge that you can use propane, DC plugs, which I'll put a picture of that up, um, but the DC plugs are, you know, something you can plug for the most part your phones and that kind of thing to charge things up with. Uh, that they'll work all the time. Any AC plugs that are wired into your DC to AC inverter, those will work if you have your inverter on. Uh, we have two of them by the bed in our camper. And any AC outlets that are not wired into the inverter will not work. So they're gonna be dead as a doornail, you won't have access to them. We have a 1200 watt inverter. You might have a smaller one, you might have a big one, you might not have one at all, you know, so each camper will be different and you know, you'll need to just figure out what you have and what you don't have. Uh, a couple of 
tips that I'm going to give about managing solar, we use an external panel in addition to the panel on the roof. Um, I have a 10 gauge wire that allows me to, it's 40 feet long, it allows me to chase the sun uh, at least within 40 feet of the camper. Be proactive. That is an important thing to remember. On sunny days, make hay while the sun's shining. You never know when you might have a few cloudy days in a row that can really throw you behind in your power reserve. So, something to keep in mind. Uh, charge even on cloudy days. You know, I mean, if it's cloudy, you can still make power. You may not make as much, and you probably won't get to 100%, but you'll at least be making power. So, shut off your inverter when you're not using it. Uh, it does pull a certain amount of power just being on. Our typical power use for this particular trip uh, that we did at Julian Price was we used lights, water pump, DC fridge, vent fans, and charging our electronic devices, phones, iPads, cameras, mics, portable fans, stuff like that. We did use the inverter on occasion to power an immersion blender so that we can make some uh, ice cream. Uh, <laughs> And Pam uses like frozen berries and, and cream and just whips it up and turns it into ice cream, which is actually really good. Managing your tanks. Freshwater tank, gray tank, black tank. One of the things that we do, and I talk about this in the video a little bit, and I actually showed you, you know, some of the stuff that I do, but basically wipe out your food debris with paper towel before you start doing any dishes at all. Don't fill the sink with water. Just use a, a small dish, and I showed this in the video. Um, and just put a little soapy water in there and use that as your source for washing all your other dishes. Don't run the water for a long time. Just kind of, uh, once you get everything soaked up and clean, just run that water and turn it off. And just keep on turning the water off. Don't, don't sit there and let it run. And you'll say, well, like I said, we had, you know, 25 gallons when we started and we, we, at the end of 10 days, we still have water left. So, you know. Let that, let that be a lesson to you. <laughs> we don't shower in the camper when we're boondocking at all. Uh, we use the toilet mainly at night and not during the day. And we do use it some during the day, but as a general rule, if we're out and about and not directly at the camper, we use facilities elsewhere. We don't do number two, only number one in the toilet as much as possible when out and about. Sometimes that's not possible and if it's not possible, it's not possible. Shy away from using number two in your in your toilet. And it's just easier to clean up. We found that the gray tank actually seems to fill quicker than the black tank, uh, particularly how we use it. So we sometimes will use the black tank as a secondary gray tank and we'll take the, the water that's left over in the dish or whatever it is we're rinsing or cleaning and dump it in the toilet. And also, if you're camping somewhere where there's not any hot showers, you can actually use what's called a solar shower. Um, Nemo makes one. There's there's a lot of different ones out there that are available for just heating it up. You basically fill it with water. You can fill it from a creek, lake, whatever. I mean, it doesn't have to be like perfectly pure to clean water to take a shower in. So use creek water and just set it in the sun and the sun will actually heat it up you know, during the day. And, and believe me, they'll, they'll get hot. I mean, they actually, it's a very comfortable, warm, shower. Another comment I want to make about our setup is that I don't believe that our tank monitors are 100% accurate. I don't know that I would trust them. The freshwater tank seems to be pretty accurate, but the black and gray tank monitors, I question. We were at 66% full according to the, to the monitor on June 11th. So I thought, well, I better dump, you know, so we dumped. After I dumped, my uh, black tank was still at 66% after I dumped and my gray tank was at 33%. Interestingly, the next day, my black tank was at 33% and my gray tank was still at 33%. So like I say, I don't know that I would completely trust the black tank and the gray tank, but you can always check your black tank just by looking in the toilet. Open the valve, I don't want to cut your pump off before you do this, otherwise you'll be running water. And look down in there, you know? Yeah, I mean, you can tell how full the dang thing is, uh, pretty much. You know, you know if you're getting full, let's put it that way. Then another thing to keep track of probably for your gray tank is just watch if your shower, because that's gonna be your lowest drain location. If your shower starts getting some water in it coming up through the drain, you're full. So <laughs> stop putting water in there. I, I'm also gonna put, uh, 
a boondocking reference document in the description. Um, I'm hoping that, you know, that would be something that would be helpful. I'm going to, it's kind of just a, basically an overview of all the things I'm just now talking about. And then if you have uh, questions that I haven't answered that you're wondering about, then, you know, feel free to make a comment and I will do my best to answer them because uh, I do check those comments and I, I answer questions. So um, not saying that I have the answers to everything because I don't, but, um, you know, I will do my best. <laughs> so anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and uh, see you later, gangsters. <laughs>